Hey everyone, I think we'll try to get rolling. We've got two exciting talks to hear today. Um, thanks so much for coming. We're doing something a little bit different with our last uh, EV seminar of the quarter and academic year. We wanted to create some opportunities to hear from finishing PhD students from our department about the kinds of exciting research that they've been doing over their last five-ish years here. Um, so we have two great talks lined up today. Uh, their advisors are here to introduce them. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Paul Barber. We'll be introducing our first speaker. Thank you for coming. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Colin. Um, I know we have two speakers today, so I'm going to try to keep this brief. But I think it's important to to maintain the tradition of roasting your student a little bit at their at their finishing talk. Um, and um, I just want to start by saying that in in many ways, it's really surprising that. Uh, Sam is here finishing his PhD uh, on fish gut microbiomes uh, because, uh, you know, Sam was a, a student in the diversity project, uh, I think in 2016. And uh, my last memory of him in Morea was uh, essentially being missing at sea. He, uh, he went out kayaking to see the sunset at the reef and um, uh, we were leaving to go back to, to UCLA and I had no idea where Sam was, um, but uh, he, he did paddle back. And, um, uh, you know, that sort of started his journey uh, towards uh, studying uh, gut microbiomes. And in, in many ways, I, I shouldn't be too surprised that, that he decided to focus on this direction because one of the other indelible memories of uh, Sam as a student in the diversity project is, is uh, I gave him a copy of Forrest, Bower, Forrest Rower's book, uh, Microbial Seas. And he, he basically polished it off in I think one or two nights and, and was, was asking for more. And so, um, you know, he, he, he really, developed this passion for uh, understanding uh, microbes and the roles uh, that they play in the ecology and, and function of, of really the entire world around us. And one of the things that um, Forrest Rower impressed on me is that, uh, you know, microbes control the world. And uh, Sam is trying to understand how microbes uh, control marine fishes and, and how they've evolved and uh, how they interact with their environments. And uh, it's been amazing to have him in the lab and, and to have him bring his, his skills and his passion as a scientist. And, um, you know, the last thing that I will note here uh, is that um, he earned a, a, a NSF postdoctoral fellowship, which he'll be taking uh, with Rob Knight and Catherine Amato uh, at Northwestern to delve deeper into the evolution of, of vertebrate cut microbiomes and trying to understand how their ecology and evolution play into the, um, the, the evolution of these microbial communities. So without further ado, uh, Sam, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I wish we were both here to celebrate, uh, but uh, I know you'll be coming back and uh, we'll, we'll mark your achievement appropriately. Um, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. I, uh, I thought I almost got away with uh, that expedition I did six years ago. So thank you for now telling the entire world. Um, but yeah, as, as Paul said, I am largely interested in coral reef fish gut microbiomes. Um, and I should say I'm presenting from Columbia. So if I'm laggy or if there's background noise, I apologize. Um, interrupt me, please, if, if we need to uh, do something to fix it. Um, and so, yeah, my, my thesis revolves around coral reef fish gut microbiomes, particularly in how they are shaped by ecology and, and evolution. And so, um, you know, just taking a quick step back, I'm working with gut microbiomes, and I think anytime you're working with bacteria, it's, it's important to understand, you know, how abundant 
and diverse they really are. So, you know, one estimate puts bacteria at about a trillion species that inhabit Earth. And, you know, I, I, in my opinion, that's just pretty much in, impossible to comprehend. Um, but, you know, not only are they diverse, but they're also everywhere. So we find them in every ecosystem on the planet, um, you know, from the frozen tundra all the way up into the clouds. So, you know, there, now there is the cloud microbiome. Uh, it's a thing. And sorry, I truck is faster back. And so, you know, another, another uh, interesting and fascinating ecosystem uh, that bacteria reside in is the gut of animals. Um, and so we refer to this collective community of bacteria that, that thrive within the guts of animals as the gut microbiome. Um, and it performs vital functions uh, for its hosts. And so, you know, a big one is metabolism. The last salad you have, you owe that to the bacteria within your gut um, that were able to, you know, uh, degrade the fiber into short chain fatty acids for, for producing energy. Um, you know, they also provide us with immune function. And now we are starting to learn that they can even modulate our behavior. So, you know, it's no surprise that there's been a drastic increase in the interest in, in gut microbiome research over the years. Um, particularly if you look at, you know, the number of studies published, you can see that there's been this drastic rise and, and interest continues to grow. But, you know, despite this interest, we still don't really have a firm grasp on, on how the gut microbiome is shaped, um, and particularly in the context of ecology and, and evolution. Um, and so what we do have is sort of this loose framework of the factors that are involved in, in shaping your gut microbiome. Um, so host evolution is an obvious one. Um, so who you are as a species, humans have different gut microbiomes than, than zebras, just for the fact that they're different host species. Um, what you eat is also a big factor. So, you know, a carnivore is going to have a different gut microbiome than an herbivore. And then finally, where you live will also uh, play a role in shaping your gut microbiome. Um, and so, you know, we know these and side note, I will be saying host phylogeny and host evolution interchangeably. Um, I'm, I'm basically referring to who you are as a host species. And so, you know, we have these three factors, but when you go into literature, you'll find a lot of con conflicting results um, regarding these factors and, and in terms of how important they are. So, you know, you'll find one study, and this is quite an important study that came out 10 years ago, claiming diet to be the main driver of gut microbiome diversity. Um, you know, and then later on, another study came out with completely contradicting results saying that, you know, your host evolution outweighed what you ate uh, in terms of shaping your gut microbiome. Uh, and you'll find these contradicting examples throughout the literature. And so one reason uh, this, is kind of, this is hard to do and um, we have these issues is it's actually hard to tease apart factors such as host biology and host diet and, and you know trying to figure out how they shape gut microbiomes and I'll give you guys an example here um, and, and this issue isn't restricted to gut microbiome research I'm sure a lot of people in EEB have also had this problem um, in comparative analyses uh, so say you're, you're interested in the gut microbiomes of artiodactyls and, and carnivores two different phylogenetic groups they eat different things um, and so you sequence their gut microbiomes and you get different results. So the issue here is you can't attribute the differences um, to being either due to host phylogeny or host diet because they're two distinct phylogenetic groups and they eat different things. Um, and so really the fault is your study design. And so, you know, one way to tackle this issue is to actually add variation within the clades of of the species that you're sampling. And so a good example is the panda bear. It's unique in that it's a strict herbivore, you know, unlike its cousins that eat meat or are omnivores. And so, you know, if you do the same kind of study and you find that panda bears have unique gut microbiomes um, compared to all of its cousins, you can be more confident in saying, okay, this is likely due to host diet because you're sort of controlling for host phylogeny with the variation you added. And then, you know, a follow-up step to this um, and another solution is to add in distantly related hosts. So fish, for example. Um, and so this, 
you know, increase in phylogenetic distance between the two groups adds some more control over, you know, you're able to better isolate the effects of other factors like host diet. So say if this herbivorous fish here has a similar gut microbiome to the panda bear, now you can be even more confident saying, okay, this is likely due to herbivory because I was able to control for host phylogenetic effects. And so, you know, this is easier said than done. Um, gut microbiome research is very expensive. Uh, you know, to do this type of work, you're likely sampling diverse sets of hosts. You likely have to travel um, you know, to very remote places around, around the world to do this. Um, and so, you know, what better lab to tackle this than the Barber Lab, where we are experts in traveling to remote places around the world on a budget. And uh, so, and, you know, being a marine biology lab, it made a lot of sense for me to, to consider coral reef fish as a study system, and I'll explain why. Um, so coral reef fish are phylogenetically very diverse. Uh, within the same reef, you will find dozens upon dozens of species sharing the, that same reef, um, as you can see in this picture. And on top of that, a lot of these species have, will have very different distinct diets. So there's, there's great dietary diversity among coral reef fish. And then also uh, you can find the same species of fish in a completely different ocean around, you know, across the world. Um, so there's incredible environmental diversity as well. And lastly, uh, you know, up until my PhD, coral reef fish had, or fish in general actually had been sort of dismissed as having these, uh, you know, very simple transient gut microbiomes. You know, they weren't as complex and diverse as mammals. Um, and I found that really surprising given how diverse they are across these sets of factors, you know, phylogeny and diet and, and habitat. Um, and so, you know, I aim to use coral reef fish as a study system to better tackle how, you know, answer the questions of how host ecology and host evolution may impact uh, vertebrate gut microbiomes. And so I targeted 20 species of coral reef fish. I aim to maximize, you know, as much phylogenetic diversity as I could, as you can see in this phylogeny here. And more importantly, um, I made sure to include some you know, dietary diversity within given clades of fish. Um, and so down here, there's three butterfly fish that I sampled. Um, and you can see there's two corallivores and one omnivore. And then, you know, an even better example, there's two sister taxa, so very closely relate, related surgeon fish. One's an herbivore, one's a detritivore. So this variation in diet was important, as I explained earlier, to, to have the study design. And so, you know, this is another chapter in itself that I won't get to, but I also sampled these fish across three different islands um, to add environmental diversity to, to the study design. And so I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, if, if you're interested uh, later, I can answer any questions. And uh, briefly just want to mention that I didn't do this alone. I was able to collect over a thousand fish gut microbiome samples throughout my PhD. Um, and so clearly I needed help for that. And, I got it from this amazing food web team that was interested in building a, a complete food web of coral reef fish. And for that, they needed gut contents. And I needed gut contents, so it made a lot of sense for us to, to combine our efforts. And here's just a typical field day um, where we all work together to collect these fish via spear fishing. Um, and then, you know, we dissect out the guts and um, you know, and using sterile te techniques, I was able to bring back gut samples back to UCLA. Um, and also, I just have this for proof. My mom is, is, in the, is in the Zoom chat. And so, mom, I wasn't just lounging on a beach chair with mojito, at least for most of the days. Uh, and I'll briefly go over the methodology. I, I won't get into it. So if you want to know more, feel free to ask. But you know, for generating gut microbiome data, you want to start with the hindgut. That's where most of the bacteria reside in. Um, and then after that, you want to isolate the 16S rRNA gene. It's a universal gene that all bacteria have. So it's a great way to isolate bacterial DNA. And also this gene has a lot of um, variable regions within it. And so you can distinguish between different uh, groups, different species of bacteria. And so, you know, after going through high throughput sequencing, bioinformatic analysis, processing, um, you can analyze and visualize your data. 
And so a very common uh, end product of, of this whole pipeline is a PCOA plot, which allows you to visualize all of your samples in a 2D space. Um, and just to make sure we're all on the same page, all you need to know is that each dot here represents a gut microbiome sample of a given fish. And the farther away the two dots are from each other, the more different they are from one another in terms of the community bacteria that they have. And so these are all the fish that I sampled for this particular chapter. And they are color coded by host family, which I'm using as a proxy for host phylogeny. And so we can see here that, you know, it does explain some of the very variation that we're seeing, but there are some very important exceptions. Um, so, you know, in red are surgeon fish, Acantheridae, and we can, we can see, you know, towards the bottom left, there's this group that has migrated away from, from its cousins. Um, and again, there's, you know, these in yellow are labyrinths, and it seems like there's this whole group of labyrinths that had migrated away from, you know, the big yellow cluster on the bottom left as well. Um, and so what happens is if, if you color code the same data set by diet instead of host phylogeny, uh, we could see that these exceptions, if you will, get resolved, um, where the surgeon fish that seem to have migrated away from their cousins now are properly labeled, uh, you know, with, their, with the other detritivores, which was their feeding group that they shared a diet with. And the same with the labrids, they happen to be a carnivore, and now they are you know, seem to be correctly in the, the carnivore cluster, if you will. And so, you know, diet seems to do a little better job of explaining this variation, but it, there still seems to be something going on where we have these three big clusters. And so for the purpose of this talk, I'll, I'll refer to these clusters as a carnivore cluster. We have an omnivore-like uh, omnivore cluster and then an herbivore-like cluster. Um, and the reason for that is because, um, you know, when I saw this data, I was immediately reminded of this 2008 paper that had come out on mammals. It was sort of the big first comparative study on, on gut microbiomes that had been done. And, you know, it looked, it really looked like they had the same pattern that I did in my fish data set, um, where we have this, you know, herbivore, omnivore, carnivore like cluster. And so naturally this begs the question, am I seeing the same thing? You know, what happens if, if I plot all of this data together? And so that's exactly what I did. I basically stole a bunch of data that was publicly available on um, some several mammalian data sets. I also added some other vertebrates and some other environmental data to basically create this mega microbiome data set, um, which I'm showing here on a PCOA plot. And you know, there's a lot to unpack here, but what I want everyone to focus on is uh, are the mammals and, and fish that we see here. So in blue, we have the mammals, and you know, there's some mammals that seem to have migrated over here to this cluster um, by the carnivorous fish. And coincidentally, these mammals are carnivores. And you know, the same thing happened over here with the herbivores. Um, you know, herbivorous mammals ended up clustering with herbivorous fish. And then omnivores of each group seem to do their own thing. But, um, you know, this convergence that we're seeing on this plot, you know, it might make sense. Like, okay, you know, they're clustering by diet, so what? Um, but as I said earlier, you know, up until this point, fish had really been dismissed in the literature as having these simple gut microbiomes, whereas mammals were, you know, touted as like having, you know, the complex, diverse gut microbiomes that we needed to study. Um, and you know, this, this data set is, is painting a very different story here. And on top of that, when you think about how different mammals and fish are from one another, they're separated by 365 million years of evolution. Um, and one, one lives on land, the other lives in water. And yet the, gut, the microbes within their guts um, you know, seem to be the same microbes, at least for carnivores and herbivores, which, which is pretty surprising. And so, you know, that's just a visualization. Is, is this actually backed up by stats? Um, and so I was fortunate enough to have the help of this amazing stats wizard, Dr. Shidakati, a colleague of mine. Um, she helped me build a Bayesian linear model to, to fur further analyze this data, where you're able, within this model, you're able to compare different groups to one another. And so on the x-axis, we have the, um, 
the intercept of this model where the higher the intercept is, the more similar two groups are in terms of their gut microbiome. And so here we have every combination of fish and mammal comparisons, whether it being herbivore or carnivores. And the main takeaway here is that the two most similar groups at the top um, are fish and mammal carnivores and then fish and mammal herbivores. And then the rest of the comparisons fall behind. And so you know, the short answer is yes, the stats that, that we've done do support what we see on the PCOA plot. Um, and so does it make sense when we look at the actual microbes that are there? You know, what microbes are, are the fish and mammals actually sharing with each other? Um, and so here we have the top uh, bacterial species that are shared between fish and mammals. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the number of occurrences that a given microbe was shared, whether it being um, between carnivores in orange or herbivores uh, in purple. And so I, I, won't, I won't go through all of these species here, um, that, that could take a while. But, you know, as an example, we have Ruminococcus here, which was one of the top herbivore uh, shared microbes, um, part of the phyla firmicutes. And uh, this genus is, is, is interesting because it's well known uh, for being found in uh, the rumen of cows, hence the name ruminococcus. And it's a critical component to fermentation for, for not only cows, but a lot of mammals uh, that eat plant material. And so my data is suggesting that fish also may rely on ruminococcus for their own fermentation of, you know, not terrestrial plants, but marine algae. Um, and there are other species in this mix that also are involved in um, in fermentation as well. So supporting that theory, uh, Tryponema above ruminococcus it has, has been found in high abundances in uh, humans that are part of the Hadza hunter-gatherer tribe. Um, and they attribute this to, to their high fiber um, content in their diet. So this, fer this basis for fermentation driving convergence between fish and mammals seems to to be backed up by what species are there. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the carnivores, I, I couldn't really find a pattern um, in the carnivores. And I think that's actually interesting because, you know, when thinking of carnivores, I do know that, you know, they, they seem to have their own enzymes for metabolism. You know, like humans have pepsin to break down our own protein. Um, so maybe there isn't this metabolic requirement such as fermentation but clearly something's going on because they're sharing a lot of microbes. Um, but when you look in the literature, there really wasn't a pattern. Um, a lot of these microbes actually haven't even been dis described. They've just been sequenced. So I think uh, carnivore gut microbiomes is a whole open area of research um, that I I'm pretty excited about. And if anyone has any ideas on how to approach that further, I'd be happy to talk. Um, and so for the sake of time, I, I will try to wrap things up. Um, but going back to this conceptual model that I had earlier, um, you know, I, I think the chapter that I just presented definitely doesn't um, resolve this, you know, this question of how gut microbiomes are shaped. But I think what it does do is it really brings host diets to the forefront. Um, of what's driving gut microbiome diversity, particularly when you're looking at hosts from a very broad perspective. Um, I think the other two chapters that I did show that host evolution and host environment become more important when you look at things on a finer scale. So maybe just within fish or just within mammals, you'll see a bigger effect of host evolution and host environment. And so all three factors seem to be important. It's just a matter of scale. Um, and so with that, I, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Paul Barber for, for making all of this possible. Uh, I also, the, the food web team, I would not have been able to collect all the fish that I did without them. And I also had some amazing undergraduates who were part of my thesis. Um, and also I would like to thank the EB department for um, really being an amazing place to, to do a PhD. And I'll be very sad to uh, say goodbye, so. Um, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
If, uh, if I heard you correctly, you're asking if, if mammals that eat fish and comparing that yeah, to like, fish so, carnivores? Yeah, so comparing reptiles and mammals together, comparing the um, Yeah, I honestly, I hadn't even thought of that, but that's like grizzly bears, I guess, right? That eat salmon. Um, yeah, that, that could actually be uh, very interesting. Um, like maybe fish have some kind of tissue that are unique and you know put them set them apart from other carnivores. Uh, yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. My my guess would be that we wouldn't find as a surprising similarity based on what I saw because you know there's there's fish carnivores that that eat invertebrates. There's other ones that eat fish, and they all seem to sort of cluster together. Um, with the mammals that are eating, you know, terrestrial uh, prey. So, but if, if, if they do, that would be very surprising. And there's a question for you in the chat window as well. Oh. Uh, do you see evidence for co-phylogeny between gut bacteria and their hosts? Um, so yeah, I did run some analyses to look at co-phylogeny, um, and it seemed, it, it backed up what, what Moeller had found where, you know, the mammals seem to have a lot stronger co-phylogeny than other taxa. And, you know, when I compared my fish to my mammals, uh, I saw the same thing, uh, where fish kind of lagged behind and didn't really show any co-phylogenetic effects, but the mammals seem to have, uh, a lot more co-phylogeny going on. Um, and I know I have a friend of mine who has a theory that it's because mammals have a, a, you know, what does set them apart is their immune system is a lot more complex compared to other vertebrates um, in terms of how complex their T cells are. Um, and we know that the gut microbiome is heavily involved in developing uh, your T cells at adolescence. Um, so that's one theory why mammals might have more co-phylogeny than, than other groups. One last question. Uh, thanks, that was a great talk. So one of the things that uh, mammals have done, as well as having complex gut microbiomes, but especially the herbivores have um, specialized uh, GI tract, right? The morphology of the gastrointestinal system is pretty specialized, especially in herbivores. I'm not familiar with fish GI tracts, but do you know if there's any differentiation between carnivore fish uh, intestinal tracts and system versus um, herbivores, for example? Um, so if I heard it correctly, you're asking if, if fish also have like unique gut morphology. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, honestly, I should have showed a slide because when we dissected all the fish, we took pictures and it's actually very amazing. Um, like the carnivore fish, their, their guts can be like on, you know, centimeters, like two, three, five centimeters short. You know, they're very simple. Uh, and then, the, yes, there are some fish herbivores with crazy gut morphologies. Um, you know, some have these like, like whirlpool formations in the, in the middle. Um, and, and branches coming out. And, and so, yeah, and, and they reach about 100 centimeters in some cases for very small fish. Um, so yeah, there's definitely something going on with, with fish compartmentalizing their guts for different types of fermentation and, and no one's really looked at it. Um, yeah, if you go in the literature, there's hardly anything on fish herbivore fermentation. So I think it's a very interesting area of, of work. Thanks, Sam. One more time for anybody talking. Thank you so much. Thank you. I welcome everyone to the second talk today. I have the uh, distinct pleasure of introducing Chris Kirazis, uh, who is a graduate student in my lab and Bob Wayne's lab. 
Chris did his undergraduate degree at University of Chicago, where he got a bachelor's of science in biological science, uh, specializing in ecology and evolution, graduating in 2015. He did some research at the Field Museum in Chicago on diversification of population dynamics and island populations, and was quite successful at publishing a couple of papers in that uh, time period before graduate school. So he came to UCLA to work with Bob Wayne in 2017, and I served on his uh, committee. And uh, what I remember from the time, Chris was planning some empirical projects uh, looking at genetic variation in different species and, and conservation. And you know, we were talking one day, and he had an interest in, in thinking about simulation models, potentially, of, of genetic variation. And we sort of came up with this uh, side project that he would you know, sort of start to work on in his uh, free time. And anyway, this project ended up taking on a life of its own. And he'll tell us about a lot of the specifics of that uh, you know, uh, in his talk uh, in a few minutes, if, once I stop talking. Um, but I just want to say that this uh, work was really pushing the, the boundaries of you know, uh, computational models in population genetics uh, in a lot of ways and uh, really influenced a lot of my own thinking on, on these topics. And I think it's, the work has had a really big impact in the community already, generating lots of discussion and uh, potentially breaking some uh, long held paradigms in the conservation biology field. And that's course quite quite uh, upsetting to some uh, some folks and I think Chris has really handled that discussion of um, uh, among some really big personalities in the field with with poise thoughtfulness rigor and um, you know it's just been really super impressive to uh, to see I think one of the hardest parts though was uh, with Chris when I was working with him uh, on helping him prepare for the presentation was trying to really fit all of his work into a 90 minute talk uh, that he's uh, going yeah, to give. <laughs> I mean, 30 minute uh, talk um, that he's going to give. Um, in all seriousness, he does have uh, three other uh, first author papers he could also be adding in. Uh, so it's just been amazing what he's been able to do in a, in a few years working with, with Bob and me. It's been an absolute joy to have him in the lab. Uh, he's really been a amazing resource for all of us for intellectual contributions and technical contributions and simulations. We will miss him, but lucky for us, he's going to be sticking around after he finishes up for, for a year or so. So it'd be great to uh, keep uh, learning from him. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Chris because I've probably used up uh, much of his 90 minutes. Yes, thank you, Kurt. All right, so yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Like Kirk said, I'm gonna try to cover a few different projects, some in more detail than others. Uh, so strap in and yeah, excited to tell you about what I've been doing the last five years. If this will work, okay. All right, so I don't think I need to spend a ton of time convincing everybody here that we're currently experiencing an ongoing six extinction crisis there are a variety of factors that contribute to this, of course, things like habitat destruction, fragmentation that we're quite familiar with here in Southern California, over harvesting and so on. And so when populations become small, there's a number of genetic threats that can contribute to extinction that we might be concerned about. So first and maybe foremost among these is inbreeding depression, which is this loss of fitness that can occur when individuals mate with close relatives that can expose recessive deleterious mutations. Um, a related but somewhat different concept is this idea of mutational meltdown, which is more of a gradual decline in fitness uh, due to increased genetic drift in small populations. And finally, uh, loss of evolutionary potential that can happen when small populations lose genetic variation. And so often these different factors are sort of conceptualized in this idea of an extinction vortex in small populations where these mechanisms can interact synergistically and together drive a population to extinction. So I think a really nice case study for thinking about 
what it might look like for a population to go nearly to extinction because of genetic factors and specifically inbreeding depression is the Isle Royale wolf population. And so many of you may be familiar with the Isle Royale system. Uh, the wolves and the moose together have been sort of a classic uh, case study in population ecology, mostly from the perspective of predator prey dynamics. Uh, but over the last couple of decades, the wolf population has also been uh, of interest, as you can see here, because of this decline that happened in the population um, from an average of maybe 25 or so individuals from year to year down to just two individuals in 2019 prior to uh, the National Park Service deciding to initiate reintroductions. And so there have been a couple of studies that have looked at uh, the causes of this decline in the population. Uh, first, this study from 2009 looked at skeletal traits of wolves on the island and showed that these congenital deformities that you can see are were really quite widespread, even uh, at uh, this point in 2009. And more recently, Jacqueline Robinson, who did her PhD here at UCLA, did a genomic study of the population uh, where she showed uh, that when you compare whole genomes of the mainland healthy outbred Minnesota wolves to uh, the inbred wolves on Isle Royal, what you see is this really striking pattern of these long runs of homozygosity in these genomes, these huge chunks of the genome that are entirely homozygous, in some cases, entire chromosomes, uh, which is really a direct consequence of this recent inbreeding and inheritance of these chromosomes identical by descent. And so the consequence of this then is when an individual has these long runs of homozygosity in their genome, uh, any recessive harmful mutations that are within that run of homozygosity are now homozygous and can lead to these uh, severe phenotypic effects that you see on the left. So one additional thing that Jacqueline looked at in this paper is this idea that a large historical North American wolf population size could have further exacerbated extinction risk on Isle Royale. And so the thinking here is that um, in large populations, you can harbor lots of recessive, strongly deleterious variation, essentially because these mutations tend to be quite rare. And in large populations, they tend to be found as heterozygotes. And so because they're recessive, purifying selection can't uh, act to weed them out. And so sort of as a thought experiment to demonstrate that, Jacqueline did these simulations where she used published demographies for the North American population and the Tibetan uh, population, a much smaller wolf population, and essentially showed exactly what I just said, that uh, when mutations are recessive, you see more of these uh, strongly deleterious mutations in the larger populations, which importantly, as long as these populations remain large, like this North American population, you don't really care about those mutations being there because they, again, are, tend to be heterozygous. But the problem that happens is when those mutations are introduced to a small population like the Isle Royale one, and inbreeding exposes them and can result in inbreeding depression. Okay, so all of this uh, for me served as really nice motivation uh, for thinking about what became my first thesis chapter um, and thinking about this Isle Royal system as a really nice sort of anecdote, uh, really nice example, sort of hinting at this importance of historical demography uh, on extinction risk due to inbreeding depression. And for me, the question was, okay, how can we try to generalize this relationship um, and say something broader about uh, the role of historical demography influencing extinction risk in small populations? And so this is where simulations come in. As Kirk mentioned, a lot of what I'm gonna tell you about today uh, has to do with simulations, which you know, many people in various fields in science and in ecology and evolution might be familiar with the notion of a simulation, just using some model to uh, explore hypothetical scenarios. In population genetic simulations, I think are really widely used. Um, but in conservation genetics, historically, not as much. And I think there's a variety of reasons why this is. But maybe one of the key ones is that population genetic models typically make lots of ecologically unrealistic assumptions that sort of limit their applicability to thinking about things like extinction. And so the key one here that I wanted to highlight is that um, in the Wright-Fisher model, which is our sort of ubiquitous population genetics model, it's assumed that uh, your population size is a sort of fixed quantity that's not influenced by the fitness of a population. And so in that sense, populations that you're simulating can't really go extinct due to a decline in fitness uh, from genetic factors. 
And so that's where this slim non right Fisher model comes in uh, that really sort of open doors for doing lots of new and cool simulations uh, using population genetics models. So SLIM, I should say, is a widely used uh, simulation program in population genetics that can do all sorts of different things. This non right Fisher model in particular um, was introduced right around the time I was thinking about this project, really with the goal of trying to overcome these uh, ecologically unrealistic assumptions of pop gen models. And the key way that it's doing that is instead of modeling populations in terms of uh, effective population size, uh, we're thinking about them now in terms of a carrying capacity where the population size becomes a sort of emergent property of a, a stochastic process of viability selection and reproduction at an individual level. Um, so in a sense, it's still a very ecologically simple model, but it's you know at least now equally ecologically realistic enough that uh, our simulated populations can go extinct and we can start to uh, explore this relationship uh, between historical demography and extinction risk. Okay, so a very brief overview of the model that we put together for this paper. Um, essentially, our, our goal was on the genomic side to try to incorporate wolf-like uh, genomic parameters, uh, including uh, some combination of neutral and partially or fully recessive deleterious mutations. And on the ecological side to try to uh, incorporate things like demographic stochasticity, environmental stochasticity, all the sort of classic things that people talk about um, when thinking about uh, small populations. And really the first question that we tried to address with this model then is rather simple. It's essentially how does historical population size influence ex extinction risk when we have these simulated populations of varying size? So having a carrying capacity varying from 1,000 up to 15,000, um, and then contracting them down to this small endangered population with a carrying capacity of 25, and just running the simulation until it goes extinct. And so the first thing I'll show you from these simulation results are essentially what you might expect, that if we look at uh, heterozygosity in the simulations for the ancestral populations prior to the contraction, you see more genetic diversity in the larger populations on the right than the smaller ones. That's fully expected. Um, what's also expected, but maybe somewhat overlooked, is that we also see the same pattern for these recessive, strongly deleterious mutations I was talking about earlier. Uh, again, with the reasoning being that these mutations can sort of be hidden in large populations when they're quite rare, and so uh, shielded from purifying selection, and so what we see here then is in these historically smaller populations, uh, on average per individual, maybe they have 30 of these mutations in their genome, but in these much larger ones, maybe they have 120 or so. And so the consequence of this then is when we contract these populations in the simulation and just let it run until it goes extinct, that we do see this perhaps counterintuitive result of a much longer time to extinction when coming from those historically small populations compared to the historically much larger one. So here, what this box plot is showing that is when you come from that carrying capacity 1,000 population down to 25, you might last for uh, maybe 400 generations before going extinct. But when you come from that much larger one, you might last for only, say, 50 generations before going extinct. OK, so some takeaways then from these results are first, I think they, you know, again, demonstrate that large populations uh, can harbor high levels of recessive, strongly deleterious variation, and that this variation uh, can exacerbate extinction risk due to inbreeding depression when these populations become small. Um, one final thing that I didn't have time to talk about is we also thought about, okay, what are the implications of these dynamics for genetic rescue? This idea that uh, when populations are small and inbred, you want to move individuals into them to sort of restore genetic diversity. Here it turns out that uh, the sort of conventional wisdom of picking large populations as your source population uh, might be somewhat less ideal than picking a more moderate sized source population uh, with lower levels of strongly deleterious variation um, in terms of increasing the long term outcomes of genetic rescue. So all of this was published last year. Uh, if you want to read more about it, uh, check out our publication in Evolution Letters. Okay, so very quickly, 
I don't have uh, time to really do much of any justice for my second chapter, uh, but I did want to kind of just mention it quickly and give some quick highlights. Um, here, the question now concerns thinking about this moose population on Isle Royal, which I mentioned sort of goes hand in hand with the wolf population in a lot, a lot of these classic studies, um, but is also what I didn't mention very interesting from the perspective of uh, population viability and isolation in the sense that the moose population has been isolated for much longer than the wolf population, maybe 120 years or so, also has very low genetic diversity and high levels of inbreeding, and yet despite all of that, um, appears healthy with no signs of inbreeding depression. And so what we wanted to look at in this chapter was what are the genomic underpinnings of that continued population viability, um, we did some whole genome sequencing and a bunch of simulations to essentially show that the much more moderate population size of the moose, which on average is about 1,000 individuals or so compared to 25 for the wolves, has helped enable sort of purging of those recessive deleterious variants to um, lessen the threat of inbreeding depression. So yeah, we posted a preprint of that about a month ago. Um, please check it out if you want to read more about this. Okay, finally, the, the last project I'm going to talk about, which is what I'm considering my third dissertation chapter, um, really sort of picks up on all this thinking uh, about this role of historical population size as a determinant of extinction risk, but now tries to think about, okay, how can we try to apply this thinking to management of endangered species? And so that's where the vaquita porpoise comes in. Um, some of you may be familiar with the vaquita. It's a tiny little porpoise that lives only in this most northern portion of the Gulf of California. Uh, sadly, it's the most endangered marine mammal because it's very heavily impacted by illegal gillnet fishing that happens in the Gulf of California. Uh, you can see on the bottom left here that the census estimates going back to the 90s have the population declining from around 600 individuals to roughly 10 or so remaining. And all of that's to say is that there's a lot of attention on the species and the question now really concerns whether or not the species could recover, even in the best case scenario where the fishing were to stop today. Um, and by that I mean that when we're there's only 10 individuals or so left right like inbreeding in a recovery scenario, in some cases might be thought to sort of doom the species to extinction. And some have definitely argued that that might be the case and that we should sort of give up and uh, stop devoting scarce resource, conservation resources to the vaquita that could instead be allocated elsewhere. And so some of this discussion has uh, also mentioned the fact that the vaquita is known to have low genetic diversity. This is something that's been known for many decades, um, but was also shown in this uh, genome assembly paper for the species that came out last year, um, where you can see that the vaquita has uh, essentially among the lowest genome-wide diversity of any species uh, that had their genome sequenced at this time. Uh, but the key point that uh, they make in this paper, though, is that low genetic diversity in the vaquita is sort of a natural characteristic of the species because of a small historical population size. Uh, here they estimate a historical uh, effective size of roughly 3,000 or so individuals. And so based on everything I've told you so far, you know, it's possible that this could actually be a good thing for recovery, right? And so that's, you know, where these slim models again come in, uh, where our aim here is to sort of build a slim model where we could project potential recovery scenarios over the next 50 years, again, incorporating um, genomic information from the species and uh, life history information. And so what this looked like um, was we have this genomic data set for 20 individuals um, that we use to estimate the sort of fundamental uh, parameters that underlie inbreeding depression, things like mutation rates, uh, distribution of selection coefficients, and historical demography. There's a lot of work that uh, went into this that I don't have time to talk about, but uh, this paper came out about a month ago in Science, so check it out if you want to read more about uh, what happened here. Um, but then, like I also mentioned, on top of these genomic parameters, our goal here is to um, incorporate all the life history and behavioral information that we know uh, from the species, um, which we had, uh, you know, numerous experts uh, that have been working on the species for many decades that helped us do this. Okay, 
And so what I'm showing you now essentially is our model uh, projections in the best case scenario where fishing, where bycatch mortality rates are reduced by 100%. And what you can see is that actually the model projections are really quite optimistic. So I'll walk you through this uh, for a minute. So on the top panel here, we have uh, the population size in the model over the next 50 years. Uh, where we have 100 simulation replicates. The ones that are blue are ones that don't go extinct over the next 50 years. And the ones that are colored red are the ones that do. And so there you can see that um, very few replicates are going extinct in this scenario. Recovery is generally uh, pretty substantial, despite the fact that on the middle panel, you can see the mean levels of inbreeding in the population, which do accumulate over time. Um, and on the bottom panel, you can see the mean fitness in the population, uh, which does decline somewhat, but apparently not enough to drive much of any extinction. So very rosy uh, projections in the best case scenario, but uh, when we reduce this reduction in bycatch mortality um, to even 90 or 80%, so still really large reductions in the amount of fishing that's going on, the extinction rates increase a bunch, right? So in the middle panel here, uh, with a 90% reduction, we have 20%, 27% of replicates going extinct. And with an 80% reduction, now more than half the replicates go extinct. So all of this is to underscore that there is hope for the species, but it really does depend uh, on reducing these bycatch mortality rates as much as possible. Okay, so one final point I want to make before wrapping up to really drive home this point of historical population sizes being important is that we want to ask this question. We've already sort of already sort of hinted at that this high recovery potential in the vaquita could be enabled by this small historical population size. But to more sort of explicitly test that, we wanted to increase the historical population size in our model and see how that would uh, impact recovery rates. And so to orient you for those results first, I'm gonna, these are the results I've already shown you with the 90% reduction in bycatch mortality rates, 27% of replicates going extinct. Um, but if we increase these historical population size parameters by a factor of 20, uh, now what we see is more than half the replicates are going extinct. Uh, recovery on the top right is much less substantial for replicates that don't go extinct. Um, and one of the key things you might uh, note if you squint a bit is that on the bottom right, um, fitness is declining much more with uh, even lower levels of inbreeding in these populations compared to the bottom left panel. And so that's really a consequence of this higher load of recessive harmful variation in these much historically larger populations that can contribute to inbreeding depression and drive extinction uh, in this model. Okay, so takeaways from this chapter, like I've said, the vaquita doesn't appear to be doomed to extinction by inbreeding depression, um, but recovery really would take a pretty substantial uh, reduction in uh, the amount of fishing that's going on. And again, that recovery potential appears to be greatly enhanced by the small historical population size for the species. And yeah, in conclusion for the talk, um, I think you know what all of these different chapters uh, show is first of all, that historical demography really does have a quite large influence on extinction risk. Um, one of the things that we show in my second chapter that I didn't have much time to get into, though, is that inbreeding depression can, to some extent, be purged on more recent time scales in the right sort of demographic scenarios. Um, but those scenarios may or may not be applicable in many cases. And finally, I think one point that all this work does really highlight is that simulations can be a really valuable tool um, that, in my view, remain underused in conservation genomics. Right now, we're working on a sort of review perspective piece, trying to make that case and introduce people to these types of models. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, with all that, I'd like to thank everybody here. Thanks, Kirk and Bob Wayne, a ton for being great advisors. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And happy to take questions if we have time. Yeah, Mary.
Yeah. Yeah. So the question for people on Zoom is like, are any Isle Royal re wolf reintroductions sort of doomed? I think in the long term, yeah, I think they are. I think they've, at least for the time being, committed themselves to having a wolf population there, both because it's an iconic population, but also it has an important role in maintaining the moose population at reasonable numbers so that they don't eat everything. But yeah, I think over you know coming decades, it could look like a scenario where they're having to do these reintroductions uh, every once in a while. Yeah, Joey. Yeah. This is a great question. I think, yeah, so for people on Zoom, Joey's question had to do with like, like in non-model systems where we don't have lots of parameter estimates and things like that, how do we do simulations? Um, that, yeah, I think is a challenge. It's something we talk about in the review paper as like, I think that the extent to which parameters need to be really tailored to a species sort of depend on like how much emphasis you're putting on those simulation results. Like in the case of this Vikita work, I think there's a lot uh, like hinging on those results. You know, like there's lots of other papers though that it's more sort of like, let's qualitatively explore this and like you parameters for humans, even though we're modeling lizards. So I think there's ways around it, but it's sort of context dependent. With that said, we probably need to, to wrap up, but thank you so much for your time.